Welcome to the show, James Swanick here. What if your alcohol addiction or what if your cravings for alcohol, even if you didn't feel like you were addicted, wasn't your fault? In fact, it was just a biological condition that you either had or you developed over the years. Maybe it's a lack of neurotransmitters. What are neurotransmitters? How are they driving your craving for alcohol? We're going to find out in today's conversation. I'm joined by Jodell Fitzwater, who is a nutritionist in the health and wellness space, has been for over 20 years. She has a business called Get Fit with Jodell. She's a professional paddle boarder, which we'll find out a little bit. And she comes from Southwest Missouri. And Jodell has many clients around the world uh, who experience drug, alcohol, and food addiction, amongst other things. And Jodell has been a big supporter of me and uh, my sleep business, Swanick Sleep, over the years. And she supported our blue light blocking glasses, which our customers wear in the last hour before they go to sleep um, so they can sleep better. And uh, we're going to talk about the neurotransmitters that might be affecting our cravings. Jodell, great to have you with us. James, always a pleasure. And thank you so much for inviting me on. Of course. So tell us a little bit about what neurotransmitters are and how a lack of them might be driving our alcohol cravings. Yeah. Yeah. So addictions and cravings and obsessive tendencies, you know, even things like OCD, I might get some flack for this, but these are a symptom. You know, it's not necessarily, you'll hear that alcoholism is a disease. And while people might have an opinion on that, I say it's a symptom because you reach for something, you cope for something and the effects of that are the symptom, you know, your addiction to that substance for how it makes you feel or the feeling it creates. That's a symptom. So we want to go to the root of what's causing the need for that coping mechanism or that symptom, as it were. And that starts with the neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are, in layman's terms, just chemical messengers in the body that tell you, I feel good. I don't feel good. I have motivation. I don't have motivation. I am experiencing tension. What should I do about it? I feel really elated. Or maybe I just had a really great workout and you feel kind of that high of endorphins. All of those are just a small amount of what neurotransmitters do and how they affect your moods and and how you're going to cope with the feelings that you have each day. The neurotransmitters help you do that. And a neurotransmitter is something that we're we're born with. Like, is it nature or nurture, for example? Is oh, for it, sure. Yeah, yeah. You, they they come to you. They, we need them in every day. I mean, to deal with our feelings, to deal with our emotions to uh, motivate us to do things and to get stuff done. We need these neurotransmitters. And yet in today's modern world, they're being thwarted in a lot of different ways. And we're also bombarded with a lot of pressures that lower. And some people are even just physically born with not enough of a certain neurotransmitter. So they can even have a deficiency from birth. So I always say, you're not weak-willed. If you're dealing with some sort of addiction or tendency, you don't lack discipline. You're able to brush your teeth every day, right? So we have discipline, we have willpower, but it's a biochemical imbalance in your body. It's a chemical imbalance. It's not your fault. We just need to go and balance that out. Got it. So so it's both nature and nurture. Some people are just born with a low level or ineffective neurotransmitters, whereas others might be they're born with just a, a normal level, but then they're disrupting their neurotransmitters mm-hmm. through lifestyle choices. Am I understanding mm-hmm. that correctly? Yes, exactly. I mean, stress overall can either elevate or even simultaneously lower um, and decrease completely someone's serotonin, which is their feel-good neurotransmitter. They can get too much and be agitated and irritated, and they might reach for a substance to calm that feeling. Whereas another person, they might have see a stressful situation and their serotonin may go down. They get apathetic, they get depressed, they get low moods, and they might reach for a substance like alcohol to amp them back up, to make them you know, lose their inhibitions and things like that. Mm, okay. So whether you're born with poor functioning neurotransmitters or whether you're born with perfectly functioning neurotransmitters, there are things that we can do to give ourselves the the highest or the best functioning neurotransmitters. Is that right? Correct. Or Correct. or are some people always going to be challenged because biologically they're deficient? 
Um, I believe if you give the body the proper conditions, it can heal. So even someone who is born with very low amounts of neurotransmitters, we can look at the body and give it what it needs in order to amp up that, that brain chemistry, if you will. And it's called amino acid therapy, basically. It's this form of therapy where we use amino acids, which you might know amino acids are found in protein. So protein is critical for the health of um, someone dealing with any sort of substance abuse because they're feeding their body those amino acids to help manufacture those good feel good chemicals and hormones and endorphins and neurotransmitters and also in the gut we actually make neurotransmitters in our gut so if your gut's broken and if you're not assimilating your nutrients then chances are you're also not making uh, some critical things like serotonin in your gut Got it. Okay. So just before we get into some practical things that we can do, just trying to give ourselves the, the best neurotransmitters, um, how did you get into this work? Would, was there something that happened with you or family where you really dived in and understood all of this and then made some changes? Yeah, I love that question because if I could go back knowing what I know now, back to when I was 17 and my dad was really struggling with alcoholism and um, use of marijuana and amongst other pills and things like that to get him through his day. I wish I could have introduced him to this kind of therapy. So that's why I do it now because I learned based on losing him to alcoholism, how I could help someone else. And that's what got me into nutrition. I wanted to understand how can this not happen to another individual or another young girl's father that I can, I can take this and run with it and understand the body, you know, really um, any sort of issue in the body is like, weeding out something and getting the root. You don't just go into your garden and weed out a leaf off of the plant. It's going to come back. Cravings are going to come back. You've got to get to the root of the plant, pull out the root so that that plant doesn't, that weed doesn't come back. And that's just like this issue with whatever's going on with the neurotransmitters. If we can go in and find out what neurotransmitter are they lacking? Where is the imbalance? Let's go to the root of it and dig the root out so the cravings disappear. Mm. That must have been challenging and overwhelming for you having a father who who struggled with alcohol addiction. What was that experience like? Yeah, that's a really big question because my dad was one of the most loving humans on the earth when he was sober. But when he was under the influence of alcohol or any other substance, he was the complete opposite, just a very Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde thing. So it was volatile. You never know what was coming home, you know, and so... While I loved him, there were times I couldn't be around him because he was dangerous, you know, or hurtful or whatever. But I've learned now that that was just a symptom, you know, and that's what a lot of people need to look at is this action that you're taking or had taken towards alcohol. It was a symptom. It was a coping mechanism and it was based on an imbalance. And if we can correct that imbalance, then you can come out on the other side, no longer even looking towards those substances to help you cope with life. Mm. How how old were you when your father died? Um, he well, he drank my whole life, um, but I was twenty three when he finally passed away. So got it. Yeah. And was that a catalyst for you to explore this world, or did it take some years before you got into that? Or how do you feel like your work, profession, or motivation was um, maybe inspired by what happened with your father? Yeah, really good question. Again, um, he, I wanted to understand. I've always been a question asker. So I never just take truth verbatim with somebody, what somebody says, you know, like they said, oh, he, he had the disease of alcoholism. That's what took him. I'm like, no, he didn't. There was something underneath there that drove him to need to cope with that. And I want to understand what it was. And that's why I dove headfirst into anything I could get my hands on, any sort of certifications or trainings or books, anything, research that I could find that would under help me understand the brain. Because I really felt that it was on a brain level. Why was his brain seeking those things? And one thing my father would say to me is, why do I do this if I don't want to? I don't want to be an alcoholic. I, why do I need, have this need? I want to stop. He would say that. He wanted to stop, but he didn't know how. And when I heard that, I'm like, it has to be something with the brain. So I just dug a little deeper until I could figure out what it is. And there's a lot of people out there that do practice amino acid therapy. So it's not just something I came up with. It's, it's been researched and scientifically proven for years. How would a listener know that they have neuro, a neurotransmitted deficiency? Like what are some of the signs 
that someone would find the challenging with their neurotransmitters? Yeah. So the first one I like to start with is something that's called CATs, um, catecholamines. You've probably heard of catecholamines. And these are three of our major neurotransmitters made from the amino acid tyrosine, making it highly important, again, going back to protein and taking in amino acids, that you would develop these good catecholamines. So these are dopamine, adrenaline, and epinephrine. Um, but your cats, think about like your cat, they're excitatory or inhibitory, meaning it's, it's where you derive your alertness, your focus, your drive, your motivation, your concentration, your ability to relax and not be antsy. Think of a cat who goes from zero to 60 and they freak out and then they lay down and they're completely rested and content. You know, that's your catecholamines. So somebody with low catecholamines, they're going to be really um, searching for sugar and starch and alcohol. And they're, they're really apathetic. They don't have a lot of drive and motivation and focus that you'll, you'll hear them say things like, I want to do this, but I don't even know where to start. You know, somebody with good catecholamines, they're going to be energized, upbeat, alert, they get stuff done, they don't procrastinate, you know, so it's kind of the blahs, you're going to see the blahs and people that are low on catecholamines. And that's just spell, one of them. How do you spell that? Is it with a C or a K? C, C-A-T-E-C-H-O-L-A-M-I-N-E-S. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you should be in a spelling bee. Well, right. <laughs> okay, so the, a sign that someone has l- low cats would be apathetic, no drive, or maybe they, they want to have drive, but they just can't manufacture it. They can't create it. I always say they have good intentions, but they don't follow through. And so these individuals might use a substance to get them to be less inhibited. Okay. So if they're somebody who's um, socially awkward or they lack social skills, they might use alcohol in a social setting to like, let them be free and be the life of the party and stuff like that. Or maybe they have social anxiety altogether. So Mm -hmm. they might use alcohol in that way. Now, somebody else that's low in something called GABA, which is kind of your relax, you kind of relax with GABA. Um, when you're when you're high on GABA, you're relaxed and stress free. But there, if there's a gap in your GABA, you'll be wired, stressed, tired, you'll, kind of the wired but tired. And then you'll obviously have trouble sleeping because GABA helps you calm down. So you can you can really see GABA issues with people that use alcohol to go to sleep. They might use a substance to help them relax and wind down and go to sleep because they're struggling to find that GABA. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I produce GABA with my um, supplements company, Swan Vitality. Oh, yeah, it's a very calming, very calming. uh, What is it? Like, what is GABA? Well, it's actually a neurotransmitter and an amino acid at the same time. So it's actually both. So you can actually supplement GABA as well. Um, There's certain forms that are beneficial because not all of it crosses the blood brain barrier. So it's really, you know, about getting that gut right. So you're absorbing everything correctly. And another thing is endorphins. We've heard about endorphins. This is our endogenous meaning inside morphine. So it's what you get when you get that runner's high or Mm. you get done with your workout. Like I said, and you have a really great pump and you just feel amazing. Okay. That's your endorphins. But somebody who has an imbalance is going to look like they're very sensitive. They'll be very emotional. Okay. Or they'll be very anxious if they can't get out and move and get their run in or get their workout on. They cry, they tear up easily. They crave comfort and love. They crave pleasure. So they want to they want to get any hit of pleasure that they can. Maybe they'll even cra- crave sex and porn and stuff like that. So um, they crave numbing activities too. Like that's the pleasure of video games and Facebook scrolling and Netflix binging and things like that. So that's your endorphins as well, that inside morphine basically. And that comes from, so craving those kind of numbing pleasures c- can come from having low GABA in as a, in the system? Yeah. So this one's more just endorphins in general. Endorphins so part of, general. yeah. Yeah. So part of our neurotransmitters are endorphins. These feel good things that give you this like hit of, yeah, I'm on top of the world, you know? Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And then of course, serotonin, that's a big one. Um, if you're low on serotonin, these are people that will experience depression. 
Um, if it uh, conversely, if it's too high, which happens a lot too, these are individuals that will be irritated and agitated and everything sets them on edge. They're grumpy all the time. They lash out. They, they yell a lot. These are high serotonin road rage is high serotonin. So people will use a substance then to calm them down. They're too amped up. So they rely on those three, four or five beers a night to calm them down from that agitation. And so how do we get the serotonin levels back up if they're low? Yeah. So again, it goes back to nutrition first. We want to get protein in every two to three hours because that's where you're bringing in those amino acids. Like I will use certain supplements, maybe like a 5-HTP or an L-tryptophan. Um, I can use substances or supplements to get people's amino acids up, but why not go to the gut first and really invite proper nutrition and just let the body do its own natural movement towards health. So I always like to start with that first and bring in protein, whether it's somebody who's a vegan or vegetarian or animal based, I want them to get as much protein in as they can. Every three hours is critical because we want to balance blood sugar too. A lot of things like catecholamine imbalances can happen if we're not balancing out the blood sugar. Remember how you can get lightheaded or dizzy if you don't eat or you feel hangry that's a neurotransmitter imbalance. So if we balance out that blood sugar all day, we won't get those highs and lows that call us to reach for something like alcohol or other substances. Got it. So serotonin is linked to high protein. Yeah. Yeah. And in the gut too. Remember we make our serotonin in the gut, 70 to 80% of it is made there. So if somebody's dealing with a lot of leaky gut or gut inflammation or IBS or IBD, those are going to prevent you from making proper serotonin in the gut. So we really want to look at what foods can we crowd out that are inflammatory to the gut, like gluten and soy and artificial sweeteners and food dyes. If we can eliminate those, the gut will calm down and we'll start to make our own serotonin naturally. You mentioned eating protein every three hours. What about someone who's doing intermittent fasting, for example? So you know, there's a typical one where you eat inside of an eight hour window and then you don't eat for 16 hours. So if you were waking up in the morning, let's say you had your last meal at night at say 8 PM mm-hmm. and then your intention was not to eat again until 12 PM. Cause that would include, that would be a 16 hour fast. Mm-hmm. How does that affect serotonin levels? If you're suggesting that we should be consuming protein every three hours? Yeah, until somebody really gets their brain balanced, I don't often recommend intermittent fasting because what tends to happen is people will do it for aesthetic purposes or for food control or whatever that is. But what happens during that eating window where they're not eating, sometimes they might find themselves highly anxious, highly agitated, but kind of suppressing it to where at the end of the day, then they, when they finally do get to a meal, they start to seek pleasure foods or comfort foods since they're kind of avoiding alcohol, or maybe they even do go after the alcohol because they give themselves permission since they fasted all day. So, you know, while the person needs to know thyself, you know, patient know thyself, if intermittent fasting makes you feel wonderful and you have no mood issues and you, you don't feel that the lows and the highs doing it, then go for it. But if somebody does feel like they're suppressing that feeling of, I really want to eat, but I'm denying myself that pleasure, be careful with that because later that could turn into an Uh, an imbalance since we're not getting that protein throughout the day that leads them to either overeat or overdrink or whatever later. I got it. So we had catecholamine. Did I say that correctly? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. GABA Mm -hmm. and serotonin. Yes. Yeah. What else we got? Dopamine, which is my favorite one. So Mm -hmm. dopamine is our I feel motivated neurotransmitter. And this is vastly made in a really cool way. By seeing the light during the day, sunlight first thing in the morning is huge for dopamine. Watching that sunrise through your naked eyes, no sunglasses, no contacts, no swan with glasses. We just want to see that body make dopamine each day. Dopamine is also made more available by bright sunlight throughout the day. So getting outside and balancing that light with your protein intake can actually balance out dopamine as well. So somebody with low dopamine, they're not going to have a lot of energy. They're not going to have a lot of motivation. They're not going to have a lot of get up and go. Even things like um, fear, FOMO, fear of missing out, they're usually addicted to their device because every time we scroll and we see somebody liked our comment, that's a tiny hit of dopamine. 
but yet it's just like alcohol. Every time you amp up your production or your intake of alcohol, you get a little more sensitive to it to where you can handle more and more and more and it gets out of control. The same happens with dopamine. You can become dopamine deficient because you're getting too many hits from this social life that we're all online with. And so one of the best things to do outside of watching the sunrise and getting lots of sun exposure throughout your day for dopamine is actually de detoxing off of these digital devices. We want to dampen the load of how many dopamine hits we're getting throughout the day from our social media. Yeah. And replace it with being out in sunlight, Absolutely. in natural sunlight. Yeah. And, and for a there... lot of these um, neurotransmitters, one of the best things people can do is get their light hygiene right. Balance out that light. You need sunlight during the day and you need to put on your blue blockers at night to block that blue light. Blue light is very dangerous for creating cravings after dark. If studies have shown that one hour of blue light after the sun goes down stimulates insulin. If you haven't eaten anything or it's way after dinner and you're stimulating insulin, well, then your blood sugar is going to drop because insulin pushed whatever little glucose was left in your blood into the cells and you're left low, hungry, you want some popcorn, you want some wine, you want some alcohol or whatever it is, and your cravings get out of control. So just simply by putting on your blue light blocking glasses, that will actually lower the need and calm the cravings in the evening specifically. Which brand of blue light blocking glasses <laughs> do you recommend, Jodell? I think you know the answer to that, Swanix. Right here, I got mine on my day blockers. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, for the listener, uh, I have a sleep company called Swanwick Sleep, and you can check it out at swanwicksleep.com. Um, we produce blue light blocking glasses, um, which you wear in the last hour before you go to sleep. Well, sorry, you can wear them actually as soon as the as soon as the sun goes down. I recommend I people do. wear them. That's what you do, yeah. I do. and I recommend that to all my clients. Please put them on as soon as the sun goes down. Match the rhythm of the sun. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I recommend that as well. However, I also know that human beings are human beings and most people won't do that. So I just say, I say to them, look, at the very least, put them on in the last hour before you're going to go to going to go to sleep. And if you are going to take your phone to bed with you, even though I recommend that you don't, right. only do so while wearing a pair of the of the blue light blocking glasses. And part of our sleep protocol, which we're always telling our, our customers and our community is expose yourself to as much natural sunlight in the morning mm -hmm. as quickly as you can and block as much artificial light at night um, as possible and that yeah. will have a profound impact on your sleep quality for sure and balance out your brain <laughs> and balance out your brain yeah okay yeah. um great so what else as far as neurotransmitters, those are the main ones people want to um, watch out for and be aware of. Uh, that dopamine one is huge because that a lot of people are finding low motivation to do anything, to work out or to you know, find a good quality relationship. I mean, it all plays into every aspect of our lives. So, um, so you want to be careful, not only if you're leaning towards getting rid of alcohol, but also watch the stimulants, watch the caffeine intake, because that can be a gateway into like needing more of the stimulation. Like if you do choose a substance that helps you use some sort of stimulation. So uh, one cup of coffee a day is fine, but aim to have some cream with it to balance out that acidic and how it quickly affects your body to give you like the jitters or the too amped up feeling that now you need to calm down later. You know, a lot of people start the day with coffee and they end it with wine. So they're amping up and then they're, they're winding down. So maybe if we don't amp so up so much, we can actually wind down a little better at night. Mm. Yeah. It's funny because, um, you're suggesting putting cream in the coffee, but then when people are doing intermittent fasting, cream will then break the fast. And so, there's so many different ways to to attack this, isn't it? Because I'm always saying if you are going to drink coffee, just drink black coffee and that's it because I know that people are prone to putting sugar and milk and all kinds of other things in their coffee. But And now you've suggested putting cream in the coffee, <laughs> which if you were doing intermittent fasting would break the fast. So it's... I guess you got to choose what which lifestyle you're going to go for, really. Yeah, well, and I think it really boils down to the individual. Like I said, if the coffee gives them the jitters, but they, they want to have that cup, what you're doing when you take, put the cream in is you're still fasting from anything that would elevate your insulin levels. 
And so they might be fasting from the, the glucose portion of putting the sugar in there, but they're just getting the fat. So they're still in effect fasting from the effects of insulin. And so the, it will still keep them in a fat burning state because they haven't raised their fat storing hormone, which happens to be insulin. So, but again, it's, there are, as you said, a lot of school of thought out there. And my approach with any client is bio-individuality. If I see that they're too stressed out and that coffee amps them up and stresses them out further, then I know there's a crash coming later. So we have to find a balance for that. But if I see there's an individual like yourself that can have a cup of coffee and it makes them feel good to have it black and no issues, then I say, go for it. Okay. Um, so the main neurotransmitters we're talking about here is catecholamine, GABA, serotonin, and dopamine. Did I miss anything? And the endorphins too are quite important too. Oh, those, those overly sensitive people and also the ones that are seeking the pleasure and things like that. Okay. Got it. So let me just, so there were, there were five there, right? Catecholamine, GABA, serotonin, endorphins, and dopamine. Yeah, like I said, there's more, but those are the main ones that I like to focus on with individuals because those are the most common um, imbalances that we see. So let's just review what what we just went over then. So the, the pr- um, practically what we can do to get our catecholamine firing is what, or what are the practical steps? Yeah, across the board, this is going to go for all of them. So um, balancing okay. that blood sugar, eating the protein every two to three hours, Um, limiting those other stimulants in their life that could cause them to overreact. Also hydration, dehydration can lead to feelings of unrest, apathy, cravings for carbs. So aim to drink half your body weight in pure water every day and add some minerals to that because minerals like magnesium, which is also an electrolyte, are very calming. Magnesium is your calming mineral. So we definitely want to make sure that anybody that's dealing with anxiety and tension uses something like a magnesium to really calm them down. And then also, I really recommend people going gluten-free whenever they're trying to correct an imbalance in the brain. Gluten-containing foods escalate your blood sugar higher than table sugar. And you can look this up and try it yourself. Take a piece of white bread and take a spoon of sugar and test your blood sugars. More than likely, you'll see that the gluten has affected you further. So there's also a compound in gluten known as glutomorphine, which causes somewhat of an opioid addiction. It's, it's kind of like an opiate feeling. Um, which is why a lot of people find it difficult to come off of gluten. However, once you're off the gluten, even give yourself a healing phase of like 30 days, the brain calms down and many people notice less anxiety, less nervousness, less heart palpitations, less gut issues, which leads to less cravings for the substance that's the symptom of why they need to calm down. Got it. So eating protein, drinking water with magnesium Mm -hmm. or um, trace minerals, yeah, great. Yeah. Perfect. Even a pinch of sea salt in your mouth before you drink water. That's a great resource for just getting some minerals into the cells. Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then we've got gluten-free. Try to go gluten-free. Mm-hmm. Uh, sunlight first thing in the morning. Absolutely. And then blocking light, light at night. Yeah. And then what else is there about dopamine uh, well, uh, really- and endorphins? Yeah, balancing out the gut, like I said, you're going to crowd out that gluten and other inflammatory things like soy and artificial sweeteners, like think of um, sodas, diet sodas that have sucralose and aspartame and all these. These are big um, gut destroyers and also food dyes. If something says red dye number 40, you probably want to put it away. I always say if it's made by a plant, eat it, or if it grows on the earth, eat it. But if it's made in a factory plant, probably don't want to eat it. So um, next we would seed with something called bifidobacteria. It's a good probiotic that I'll use in some people, not everybody, but bifido is what we start out life with. 70% of our gut should be made up of bifidobacteria. So this repopulates with a bacteria that helps to break down histamine from alcohol and other foods. And it also helps to be a calming bacteria that helps your gut calm down. Okay. So that's a good one too. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Um, for meat eaters, eating protein every three hours, does that mean you can eat chicken breast or steak or pork or what does it mean? Sure. Whatever somebody likes, that's an animal-based protein. 
Um, I have some grab and go options that I tell people about, you know, even pork rinds, you know, with no MSG, just pork fat and salt. That's a, that's a healthy chip you can actually take with you. No refrigeration necessary. Beef sticks, turkey sticks, you know, nitrate free beef jerky, uh, deli meat that's nitrate free and organic. You know, maybe you're going to wrap that up with a pickle spear and get your electrolytes through the pickle, you know, stuff like that. So there's a brand out there called Epic that makes meat bars and meat sticks. Those are, don't require any cooler to take with you. Just stick them in your handbag or your purse or whatever. And then in a pinch, a good quality whey protein powder that you can add to oatmeal or you can blend with coffee or you can make a smoothie out of it. That's a really nice thing because it's it's really easy on the go. Eggs, hard boiled eggs or eggs, avocado. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Avocado is like more like a good fat, right? But yeah. eggs is a good source of protein. Absolutely. And and fats are essential too. Our cell membranes are made up of fat. So again, getting in those good fats are very, fat is slow digesting. So it balances that blood sugar approach. So you're less likely to, you know, if you eat something like a bowl of cornflakes, 45 minutes you're, later, you're feeling, you know, kind of low and crazy mm. feeling and you don't have a lot of energy and you're reaching for something else. Whereas if you had like a bowl of oatmeal with a couple of eggs on the side, then you're good for a few hours until you need mm. protein again. And the exercise is, what is that? Which one does that trigger the most? Serotonin, endorphins, dopamine, GABA, catecholamine, all of it, all of the above? All of it. All of it. You're going to get better, especially with resistance training, because stimulating the muscle is very, um, in, very balancing for the brain. It gives you, it's kind of like a moving meditation when you're focused on that muscle movement it kind of calms your brain down. And then at the end of it, you get that rush of endorphins that makes you feel like I did it. I did something good. I feel really good. Plus the thyroid, we got to talk about the thyroid. It plays into our brain as well. And so every time you improve muscle synthesis and you put on some lean muscle, you're amping up your metabolism. You're improving your thyroid to help you have this really great metabolic system that's burning fat, that's building neurotransmitters, that has a healthy gut, that's sleeping well at night. Like the thyroid is your master gland. And just by doing some exercise, especially resistance training, you can amp that up as well. Do you have any tips for not checking the phone so often during the day or not getting the dopamine hit from being on a phone or notifications or any that kind of stuff? Oh my gosh. I love this question so much. So Yes. First things first is don't be afraid to let people know around you. I'm not always going to have my phone on, you know, let them know ahead of time or send out a text that says today I'm not around my phone as much. So if I don't get back to you, don't worry about it. Okay. Because now we live in the society where everybody's like, you're not texting me back. What's going on? I texted you two seconds ago, you know, so let them know. And then the next thing you want to do is turn off the notifications, hide alerts. You don't need all the pinging things all the time because every time you hear that, you might not feel it, but it's a little stressor to your body. And the more stress we have, the more we have to cope. And that's where those symptoms of reaching for something come in. We have to cope with this constant stress. So turn that off. If you can turn your phone on airplane mode, especially guys carrying it in your pocket. I can send you numerous studies on how it lowers testosterone, it lowers sperm count. And when your testosterone goes down, you're depressed, you're apathetic, you don't have motivation, and you're going to stop doing the things that you love to do, which is going to lead you to do what? Reach for something out of pleasure that could be a substance you don't want to reach for. So keep your phone out of your pocket unless it's on airplane mode. And then distance yourself from your device. Put it away from you in the bedroom. Never sleep with the enemy. That's what I call it. When you have your phone right by your head, you're sleeping with the enemy. So get it as far from you as you can that you can hear it if you have an alarm or if you're a caregiver and you need to be available for kids or a parent or whatever it is that you need to hear a phone call for. But distance is your friend. The farther away from it you are, the less damage it does on your body. Every time this cell phone connects to a cell tower, it affects your body. If it's in your hand or next to you, you're getting that radiation. It's no different than when we go to cancer therapy and get radiation treatment on our body, which does, you know, they'll tell people this is going to do a lot of harm to your body. And yet we're okay with doing it in low doses every day. So we really want to mitigate our exposure and start to distance ourselves from our devices. Not only will you feel better, but this will actually help balance your brain too, because you won't have as much stress to cope with. Mm, got it. What else you got? <laughs> Any other tips? <laughs> yeah. I mean, when I'm forming a text message, I'll keep my phone on airplane mode. And then I, 
I flick it on, I set it down and I press send so that I'm not holding the phone while all this other information is coming in. You know, I do things offline more than I do it online. I'll flip it on when I need it. I flip it off when I don't. Like right now, while I'm on this podcast with you, my phone is off. I don't need anything popping up on my screen. I'm I'm kind of a minimalist anyway. I only have like one page of apps. I'm not one of these people that has like 16 different pages of apps because I track things in real life. Um, there, I love to go forage in nature and look for different plants and stuff that are edible as a nutritionist. So I'll go out and do that. And there's plenty of apps I could use to go out and scan a plant and learn what it is. But why? Why don't I just go out and discover it myself, get a book from the library? And it's very peaceful being out in nature. If somebody's struggling with anxiety and tension and addictions, getting out in nature can calm you faster than anything else. There's even studies on it. Two hours in nature can amp up your DHEA, which is your anti-aging, but also a very calming hormone that helps produce testosterone, which testosterone is very calming in both men and women. So just getting a hike in nature can really do wonders for your neurotransmitters as well. Uh, I got a couple of questions, but any, anything else, anything else proactively that I haven't asked you or that we haven't talked about that you f- would find to be uh, beneficial? Yeah. One more thing I want to say is grounding and earthing, like putting your bare feet on the earth. In my town, I'm known as the barefoot girl because I go everywhere I can barefoot. Um, but you don't necessarily have to do that much. You can get grounding mats to sleep on. You can just go outside and put your feet on the grass. Maybe for every hour you're working on a computer to calm your nervous system, you want to go out and ground for at least five minutes, just putting your feet on grass, concrete, by a body of water, whatever you can do. And what that does, studies, like 26 peer-reviewed studies actually show that it lowers inflammation. If you're under inflammation, if you have pain, then sometimes we reach for alcohol to help deal with the pain. So if we have less inflammation, maybe we'll have less of a need to reach for it. And if we calm our nervous system and that tension and anxiety, I mean, think about how great you feel when you walk along the beach by a beautiful ocean and you're barefoot. It's that feeling every day we can recreate just by grounding and earthing. Uh, I want to ask you about restaurants and eating out. Okay. Uh, and the, uh, the reason I want to ask that specifically is because there's this place around the corner from where I am at the moment, which does pho. And, uh, you know, look on the outside, it looks pretty good. You've got some beef strips in there. You've got some, you know, a little bit of noodles, which probably aren't great. And then you've got the, the, uh, I guess it's, I don't think it's broth, but it, it's something, but I suspect, I can't quite see into the kitchen, but I suspect that they're probably cooking it in oils that aren't great for me. Even though when I find when I get it and it gets presented to me, I'm thinking, looking at this and I'm going, well, it's got beef. Yeah, it's not too bad. It's got some vegetables. Okay, yeah, maybe this is all right. But I don't know. I suspect that it isn't because I don't. It feels good going in, but then later on, I'm like, eh, I don't know about this. So, have you got any thoughts on that in particular, or just eating out in general? Really great question, James. I love your questions. Um, Yeah, I'm assuming that a lot of restaurants are going to use things as flavor enhancers to get you to come back, which one of them happens to be MSG. Also, it'll look like on ingredients, yeast extract or sodium casein. It's got a lot of different words for it. Monosodium glutamate is the longhand version of MSG, but it's a flavor enhancer. And so it gets you this kick of flavor and it's excitatory, but it also disturbs your neurotransmitters. So you may find that you go out for a meal and you don't plan on drinking, but then after you have MSG, now you're a little more excited and uninhibited. And so you do reach for the drink, or maybe when you get home, you have the nightcap where you wouldn't have without the excitatory brain aspect of the MSG. And also it can cause issues with your gut too. It's very inflammatory. So um, I would suspect it has that. Yeah. You're probably seeing noodles in there that contain gluten. So that again, can have that glutomorphine effect as well. And then you're looking at a high, high amount of sodium. I love sea salt. I love salt. We're made of salt. We cry salt. We, we, the baby swims in seawater, you know, our bodies bleed seawater. If you taste your blood, it's salty. But we don't want to put it in in one bowl form where it's like 5,000 milligrams of this processed sodium. So that's another thing that you wake up puffy and irritated the next day. And that can have something to do with how you reach to cope with things. So I don't think it's just those restaurants, though, with that type of soup. I think in general, we want to be careful of eating out too much 
because we're not in control of our food. You're right. They are using these processed oils, seed oils, like vegetable oil, soybean oil, canola oil, and all of these things actually inhibit your thyroid from working. In addition to, they can express toxins in the gut that make you feel inflamed. Again, going back to how are we going to cope with this inflammation? I don't feel good. Maybe I want to have a drink to calm down. Or maybe I want to, you know, I want to get myself to sleep and I can't go to sleep because the MSG excited me. So now I need to have a nightcap kind of thing. Mm. So just limiting your amount of eating out and finding really good quality restaurants, maybe organic or gluten-free places that you know what they're putting in the food. Yeah. yeah. Um, I am injured at the moment. I actually went was in the gym about nine days ago and I was doing some uh, heavy squats and some de- deadlifts. And then I ended up doing some sumo squats where you hold a, I was holding like a 50 kilo um, dumbbell between my legs and kind of squatting down. And I felt my lower back go. And I um, have been experiencing some pain for the last, last week or so. And I've been doing a few exercises to try and correct it, but I haven't been able to exercise in now o- over a week. Like I, I, I can do some stretching, but I can't exercise. And I'm used to, I literally will exercise to the point of exertion and sweating six times a week. And then on the seventh day, I'll just walk. Mm-hmm. So it's been very frustrating for me. And I, I haven't drunk since 2010, but what I have certainly noticed in these last seven or eight days is that I'm spending more time on my phone. Mm. And last night, for example, I had a sugar craving. And I and I succumbed. I went mm-hmm. over the road. I went out, went out over the road to a gas station, and I bought myself a caramel ice cream and a little bag of sweets. And I ate it mm-hmm. too close to bedtime. You know, it was probably about eight thirty, and I was going to go to bed at nine thirty. Mm-hmm. But I, it was fascinating to me because I'm usually so stringent and so good with not eating in the last three hours before I go to sleep, and always eating. Well, not always, but. 85% of the time eating super healthy. But last night really was, I noticed the deterioration of my mind more than anything because I was craving sugar. I knew it was bad for me, but I haven't exercised in eight days. And I can feel that, em- um, sorry, not empathy, uh, empath- uh, what was the word you used? Empathy. Apathetic. Um, like, yeah, sorry. Apathy, apathy, like apathy. Apathetic. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. I'm getting my my words mixed up. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Beca- I've noticed that I've become more apathetic, mm. and uh, I wouldn't say depressed, but I would say um, feeling a sense of helplessness, mm. particularly around my injury, but then also about other things start to to seep in. So, if you were diagnosing me, or you know, what would you what would you say, or if you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I would say you have a lack of vitamin P pleasure, passion, purpose, not maybe purpose in general, but just for this week, while you're not able to fulfill that purpose of movement and working out and bettering your body, I would be the same way because pleasure, part of my pleasure is movement. I have to move every day. Some individuals that are, you know, movers and shakers, and we have to get out and we have to do things. We're high adrenaline people. So in order to get that excess adrenaline out, we have to move. You move your body and then you feel better because you're like, okay, got rid of that feeling of like, I need to do something. And when you can't do that because you have this injury, then that adrenaline builds up inside you. And that feeling of like, I don't have any pleasure is hardwired in us. We're hardwired for, for pleasure. The When we were babies and we got hungry, we got the boob or we got the bottle and that's what calmed us down. So we're programmed for a sweet taste to calm us down. And when you're in a pinch and there's nothing pleasurable around you, the quickest hit is sugar or, or alcohol for some people or anything you can just grab and put in your gullet, you know, and that's, what's going to calm you temporarily because we all know how we feel afterwards. But so we need to look at like, okay, now that you can't maybe lift weights, what else could you do that would bring you pleasure and passion and purpose? And that might be swimming. Maybe you can move your body swimming and find a body of water to go into, then you're also grounding that excess adrenaline because you're in that water, like if it's an ocean or a lake or whatever, that's calming you down because grounding is very good at bringing in this subtle vitamin P, just that connection with the earth that maybe we didn't know we needed. 
And yeah, I just remind people at the end of your life, you're not going to go, I wish I would have been on my Facebook feed a lot more. Why didn't I spend more time doing that? Or I wish I would have posted more on Instagram. That's not going to, we get these temporarily minor hits, just like we do with candy, but the true dopamine and the true neurotransmitters that we're looking for is when you watch a beautiful sunset, when you're grounding in nature and you're surrounded by creation that's so endlessly beautiful, or you're with somebody you love and you're spending a special moment. Those are the things we're going to remember. So if we can invite more of those in and less of this technology, you're going to start to feel like you can combat cravings a lot better. Well said. Joe Dell. <laughs> Thank you so much for your guidance and expertise, uh, Jodell Fitzwater. Where can we find more details about you? Yeah, you can find me. I'm not on social media because it's too stressful for me. <laughs> so you can find me at my website, getfitwithjodell.com. I do have podcasts, however, on YouTube and iTunes um, where I post my podcast like ones I've done with you. So you can look for that as the Get Fit with Jodell podcast. Anywhere there's a podcast player, you can find it, Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever you listen to podcasts, it's on there. So they can connect with me through there. They can message me on my website. So I look forward to hearing from anybody that's, you know, really wanting to enhance their brain chemistry and build up their vitamin P as well. Just before we go, when you said that um, you're not on social media, it's too stressful for you. When did you make that choice and what was going on before you made that choice? So I was always really hesitant about it, but I had a brother who was insistent that it would grow my business. So he set me up a Facebook page years ago and I grew tenfold, like had 4,000 followers and people interacting with me every day. But yet the idea of going on there and posting was very anxious for me because I don't need that. I don't require an audience. I just want to share information. So about Probably two years ago, I went and deleted my Facebook page and all the 4,000 followers. I didn't really say anything. I just said goodbye and just deleted. Now, my Instagram page is probably still there. I've never taken it down, but I haven't been on there for probably three or four years. And I don't look back because there's so much pressure um, when you're going through your feed of like what your peers are doing or what people in your field are doing that you're going, well, should I do that? I'm not doing that. Should I be posting that? You know, it's a lot of pressure. I didn't need that. Like in the eighties, when people ran a business, they didn't have to compare themselves to every other business under the sun. They just did what they love. They just took their passion and ran with it. And that's what I wanted to do. If it's organic, it's going to grow. And if it's not, then it's not meant to be. Mm. I got, uh, not kicked off, but my, sorry, I, I no longer have, or at least I haven't for the past four months, I think, had a face personal Facebook profile. So my friends and family can't reach me because uh, I, I, switched, I switched my phone and I switched my desktop and the Facebook wants to send a authentic authenticator code yeah. or something. And I haven't been able to figure it out. So I can't log into my Facebook either on my phone or on my desktop. So I literally for four months haven't had any facebook activity whatsoever and in the first four days i was freaking out going oh my god i need it i've got to have it and then in the ensuing four months i'm like yeah whatever life just goes on i you know really maybe does. someone's been trying to reach me but i don't know you know <laughs> they'll I figure it out if they're desperate enough they'll find another way yeah <laughs> yeah i i agree like it's it's we lived for so long without it. And this new Facebook is called Meta, which Meta means collecting data. So that's really all they're doing is they're invading our space and collecting our data. And so that's a whole nother topic. But I don't mm. need to give them any of my data. I just want to help people. So <laughs> mm. Jodell Fitzwater, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And uh thanks for being a big supporter of Swanee's blue light blocking glasses as well and all things health and nutrition and sleep and healthy living. Appreciate you very much. Well, thanks so much, James. It's been a pleasure.